Right. Okay, great. Uh, folks, welcome. My name is Bob Fiedler. I'm our Defense Education Forum Director. Welcome to the ROA headquarters. It's a pleasure to have all of you with us today. And I'm going to introduce our Executive Director, Major General Davis, for a few welcoming remarks. But uh, just a quick admin announcement. It is being broadcast on the Internet today. And it will be available on our website, on the FPRI website, uh, in days to come. And be sure to turn off all cell phones or put them on mute. Sir, microphone's yours. Well, good afternoon. And welcome to our, I didn't even get a good afternoon. No applause I'm introduced and no, uh, <laughs> no good afternoon. How many are you in the newspaper business? That's the way newspaper people normally are. You are, okay. I don't say good morning to anybody. Good afternoon. Um, well, w welcome to uh, the ROA uh, Minuteman Memorial Building, which uh, is one of the landmarks of Capitol Hill. We're really delighted to have you all here in this uh, very impressive panel on a very important topic. Um, We've done some calculations, and, and by our count, this is actually the 21st such defense education forum that we have partnered with FPRI. And uh, it's always a pleasure to work with your team and uh, with the, the great scholars and um, operators that uh, we have who share their insights and experience with us. This is a particularly important topic today and, and a timely one. I imagine many of you uh, saw the Washington Post this morning that had a feature story on uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, how they're uh, breaking with U.S. policy on, uh, on Syria and the foreign influence of uh, military forces, of irregular military forces on the ground in Syria is, is one of those um, contributors to the disparate views between the White House and uh, our otherwise allies in how we engage in Syria. Uh, this panel today is going to address, among other questions, the impact that these foreign fighters are having. Um, what impact will they have when this conflict is done and they return home now as combat veterans? And is there a, a possibility for future destabilization uh, from this, this force that uh, now is concentrated in, in Syria and will be scattered globally? Um, so enough of me and on to the people who actually know something about this subject. I'd now like to introduce uh, the moderator for the panel, uh, the president of FPRI, Alan Luxembourg. Thank you. I'm not actually the moderator. Here's the moderator. <laughs> but I did want to welcome you all. Um, on behalf of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, uh, we've also very much appreciated our partnership with the Reserve Officers Association. I would just say for those of you who are not familiar with FPRI, it was founded in 1955 by Robert Strazupé on the premise that a nation should think before it acts. It was good advice then. It remains good advice today. Uh, Strauss and Pei was one of the early popularizers of geopolitics, which is uh, the way uh, FPRI looks at the world through that particular lens. And my colleague uh, James Kurth defines geopolitics as the study of the mentalities and realities of the localities. So that's what we do. If you're not a member of FPRI, I urge you to look at some of the uh, papers we distributed uh, when you entered, and I hope that inspires you to join the organization. Uh, now it's my pleasure to turn over the proceedings to Mike Noonan. Mike is the director of our national security program, a uh, veteran of the Iraq War. And for the past four years, he's run a series of conferences on this foreign fighter issue, which is a uh, critical issue in it national and international security, uh, which has only been accelerated by the uh, civil war in uh, Syria. So with that, I'll turn over the proceedings to Mike Noonan. Well, thank you, Alan. Thank you, General Davis. Thank you, Bob Fiedler. And thanks to the staff here at the Reserve Officers Association. It's a pleasure to be affiliated with you and to uh, have use of your facilities and the first-rate support that you give us when we come down here. I'd like to say um, 
this kind of proves uh, the expeditionary nature of FPRI being able to come down two hours on the train. It's very easy and, as the British would say, civilized uh, way to do things. So we appreciate it very much. So today's topic is, if you've been following the news, I see Christina Wong from the Washington Times is here. She had a big piece on, in Sunday's newspaper about foreign fighters where some of our panelists were quoted. Um, as Alan said, this is the fourth event that we've had on foreign fighters. We had a conference in 2009. Um, both the webcast videos, audios, and product coming out of that conference is available at fpri.org. Uh, we had a second conference in 2010, a third in 2011, and now uh, we skipped a year, but uh, we're back in 2013 with this important issue. Uh, for me personally, it also has a, the foreign fighters issue is not just sort of a, an academic or a theoretical pursuit. In 2006, 2007, I was an Army reservist uh, mobilized uh, serving on a military transition team outside of Talafer in uh, western Nineveh province. And in our area of, of operations, there was a big, uh, if, if you're aware of the Sinjar, Sinjar records, uh, Sinjar was not far away from us. It was a major rat line for foreign fighters coming in to Iraq and causing a lot of problems. Um, particularly, I remember in, uh, I think, February or March of 2007, a, the southern market in Talafer was bombed by some Yemenis who came over and uh, detonated uh, a big V-bed in a, in a Shia Turkmen uh, market in the south side of the city. So this is a, a practical concern uh, for me as well. And if you read Christina's piece and other pieces lately, uh, what we have in Syria today is kind of reminiscent very much of the situation in Afghanistan back in the 1980s. I think at the height of, of the Iraq war, about 600 uh, foreign fighters were coming a year to Iraq. Today, uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, I think about 20% uh, of the rank and file are foreign fighters. So we're talking, you know, several thousand. Uh, about 80% of their leadership in terms of ISIS, um, not the uh, the program for, from Archer, but the Islamic State in Iraq and al-Sham. Uh, they have about 40% of their members are particularly a lot of people from Iraq and other places, about 80% of their leadership is foreign fighters. And then on the other side, we also have the, the, the reality of Syria where you have foreign fighters on the Shia side as well that are coming, um, potentially from as far away as Yemen, but definitely from Iraq and from Hezbollah next door, who's been kind of the, the shock troops uh, for, the, for the government there. So today uh, we've assembled, I think, an outstanding panel uh, I think we've distributed some materials, so I won't go into too much detail about them, uh, but we have Will McCants from the Brookings Institution. We have Barack Mendelson from Haverford College and also a senior fellow of FPRI. And then we have Clint Watts, uh, who's also at FPRI and also the president of My Borough Solutions. So I've asked each of the panelists to talk for about 10 to 15 minutes. Then we'll talk across the panel and then we'll open it up to Q&A, both for the audience here, but also the audience on the web. So without further ado, Will. Thank you very much, and thank you to FPRI for having me. Um, Barack promised on Twitter that he was going to make the argument that we shouldn't be too worried about the foreign fighters. So if, if that's the case, and I hope he's right, I'm going to inflate the, uh, inflate the threat as much as possible so Barack can come along and pop it, and we'll hear thank a big, you. big boom. Um, first, I want to talk briefly about what the draw is for foreign fighters coming into Syria. I, I think Mike's setup was a good one in explaining that we have an unprecedented uh, rate of foreign fighters coming to Syria. I mean, this early into the conflict, we're already seeing numbers uh, that rival Iraq that are getting close to the 1980s Afghanistan numbers of foreign fighters. If you think about all of the fallout that has come from those two conflicts, you can sort of anticipate some of the things that will come from the foreign fighters being in Syria. But, but why are they coming to Syria in such large numbers? I mean, first of all, you have to state the obvious that there are a large number of people suffering, and there are Sunni Muslims who are suffering, and a lot of these foreign fighters who are coming are Sunni, 
and so they see themselves as defending their co-religionists um, in an environment where the international community they believe has turned their back on them, that there, that there are no other uh, defenders there uh, to take up their cause. So that's a big, big draw um, in this conflict. Uh, the other, of course, is that Syria is right next door to Israel, and the cherished dream for jihadis of all stripes is to finally take the battle to Israel, and the fact that you can fight near the border with Israel and hope to develop some networks to get you in to do some damage is quite appealing. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind that in uh, Sunni Muslim scripture, particularly in the hadiths or these statements attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, uh, Syria is mentioned as the site of the last apocalyptic battle with the Antichrist. Um, and so you will see in a number of uh, jihadi chat forums the way that they talk about the conflict in Syria evokes a lot of this apocalyptic uh, imagery and the notion that you're you're leading up to a final battle of good versus evil can be quite intoxicating to a 23 year old. This is also the major front for the conflict, uh, sectarian conflict uh, brewing in the Middle East uh, between the Sunnis and the Shia. Um, it didn't start off as a sectarian conflict. Um, it, it started off uh, much more secular in tone, but the longer that the conflict has gone on, the more it has taken on uh, uh, sectarian tones, uh, just because of the, the, the structure of the conflict and also the regional competitive dynamics at play. In, in other words, the fact that you have a uh, Alawite who is the head of state and who is sponsored by Iran uh, and, is, and, and Hezbollah uh, fighting against a largely Sunni uh, insurgency uh, backed by the Gulf states, in particular Qatar and Saudi Arabia, it lends itself to this uh, way of framing the conflict. There are other ways to frame it. Uh, there's, there's a lot of ethnic tension as well, but this has come to predominate. Uh, so for that reason, it's also a big draw because this is seen as the, the greatest threat uh, to the Sunni community, um, even superseding the threat from the great Satan United States. This is the most immediate threat, the threat of the Shia. It is also, for a lot of these guys coming to fight, uh, and in the broader imagination of uh, Sunni Muslims in the Middle East, um, it's seen to be a, a legitimate jihad. It's a popular jihad. Um, this isn't a very controversial uh, jihad. Uh, the fact that you have someone like Yusuf Qaradawi uh, in Qatar, the, the Muslim Brotherhood spiritual guide, coming out and sanctifying this and uh, legitimating it as a, uh, a jihad worth fighting means that people who may have been hesitant and not really wanted to throw in their lot with the AQ types are going to feel less inhibited. They, they feel like you have someone of his stature sign off on this, then it must be worth fighting for. Finally, to state the obvious, um, Another reason why we have so many people is because it's easier to get there than some of the other conflicts. The, the fact that Syria is the borders, uh, a NATO state uh, whose borders uh, are fairly porous, um, the fact that it is in the heart of the Arab world, it just means that it's much easier to get to than some of these other conflicts, say in Somalia or far off Afghanistan. And so that also, I think, accounts for the flow of fighters um, coming in. Um, what's the worry uh, for, for Western countries, for the United States, and for Europe? Um, I, I think there's several. Um, the primary worry has to be the European uh, foreign fighters that are coming in and joining up with the, some of the more extreme jihadist groups. Um, the worry, of course, is that these guys carry European passports. They come, many of them come from countries that are visa waiver countries, which means they don't need a visa to get into the United States. So the concern is if they go to fight uh, uh, and gain skills uh, in this conflict, uh, that they will spread uh, the contagion uh, into, into Europe. We're already beginning to see evidence that this isn't in fact happening. Uh, over the weekend, there was, a, there was news of four Brits who had met each other, not in the UK, but in Syria, fighting in Syria, 
and uh, had gone back to the UK and started to initiate some sort of plot that was disrupted. Um, the other thing to worry about, again, for people with European passports, um, is the prospect of veteran fighters from the front uh, who have laid down their arms but are going back to do recruiting. And Clint has done a lot of work on this uh, based on the Sinjar records, but showing that some of the most effective recruiters uh, for young men uh, are ex-foreign uh, fighters. And so the worry is also not just people going back with their skills, but people going back with their tales to tell of miracles on the battlefield and attracting a new gener generation of young men to fight. <clears throat> You also have to worry in general about the foreign fighter population because of all the new skills and networks uh, that they are building. Each of these conflicts in the region um, generates a new series of networks of funders, of, uh, of suppliers, of, uh, of money men, and all of these networks get turned to whatever new conflict comes up. Someday the Syria conflict is going to stop raging, but these networks are still going to be there. The fighters are still going to be there. It's the sort of thing that Stephanie Kaplan, who's spoken to this group before, I think, the kind of work that, that she does, showing that each of these conflicts generates a, a, a new uh, um, and complicated set of networks that gets focused on future conflicts. <clears throat> It's also been pretty remarkable to watch um, how the foreign fighters from previous conflicts have been setting the agenda in Syria. Uh, the most obvious one, of course, is Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Um, now, this was an organization that has been, for the most part, uh, locally focused. Uh, but it never went away. There was a lull in its activity, but it stuck around. It's a remnant of the last war, and it's no accident that they were at the forefront of, of, of pushing um, uh, the envelope in terms of uh, um, military activity in Syria. They are the reason why VBIEDs first get introduced into Syria. It's, it's those AQI networks uh, that do it. You also have foreign fighters from old conflicts in Chechnya and Afghanistan that are responsible for steering, for serving as the emirs uh, in, say, Nusra or ISIS or some of the other groups. So the foreign fighters are not just playing a role as foot soldiers or promulgators of uh, technologies. They are also lending their combat experience to steering these groups. And we can expect the, sa the young men who are currently foot soldiers today, of course, are going to be the emirs in future conflicts of tomorrow. The other thing I think we have to worry about is the fact oddly that there's not a lot of suicide bombings. Um, you would prefer, I suppose, uh, that some of these men would, would off themselves. Um, and they're not. They're gaining valuable skills that they are going to take to future fronts. Um, and I think it's, it's, on the one hand, it's wonderful that, that you know, suicide bombings, which are very destructive, do huge damage, um, that they're not happening at the rate of some other conflicts. That's great. But on the other hand, the fact these guys are going to stick around. They're, they're not dying for the cause. They're going to go on to fight elsewhere is worrisome. <clears throat> the other thing that I worry about is, is sort of, uh, you know, what rough beast emerges from this conflict? Um, what new permutation of global jihadism comes out of this? The split between Nusra and ISIS, I think, is real. Um, and I think it's going to have big consequences for the global jihadi movement. Um, if, the, if the split remains and there's no reconciliation and ISIS continues um, to thumb its nose at Zawahiri and Al-Qaeda Central, it could be really setting itself up as a competitor for the global jihad uh, with Al-Qaeda. We haven't seen this before, and it's a worrisome development at a time when Al-Qaeda at Central itself is, is fading from view. The fact that you could have some new organization take its place is quite worrisome. I'll, I, I want to wrap things up, but I just want to put three things out there in case someone wants to bring it up in the, in the Q&A. Um, there are three things I think don't get 
talked enough, uh, don't, don't get talked about enough, um, and I just want to flag them for you. One is the role, of course, that the private money coming from the Gulf is playing. Um, it has played a major role in keeping the opposition fractured uh, because the, the Salafi groups don't have any incentive to join with the FSA if they're getting their money from somewhere else. And in, in many ways, it cuts out the middleman. Um, it gets the money directly to the groups. There's no strings attached to it. They can do what they want to with it. The other thing I would flag for you is that we've seen in previous conflicts uh, that refugee camps uh, have been a major source for recruiting. Um, there are massive camps being set up uh, all around uh, Syria and the neighboring countries. You can bet that recruiters are going to be doing their work there. Uh, and then finally, something that doesn't get talked about much at all is the, are the other foreign fighters, which of course are the Shia. And I don't just mean Hezbollah, but volunteers that are also streaming in from Iraq and elsewhere. And there's, there's much less information available about those, but I'd be really interested uh, uh, to see more on the topic because to be sure it's going to have long-lasting consequences after Syria settles down. I'll wrap it up there. Thanks. Clint. All right. So uh, thanks for having me here, Mike. Mike sent me to several of these uh, foreign fighter uh, conferences, and it's something I've been studying for years. And so I'm excited to be here to talk about it because uh, this is round three. Uh, for those that have, uh, uh, you know, seen you know me present before, uh, and and the things that I write mostly at FPRI. Uh, we're seeing a cycle that has continued, you know, since the late 70s, early 1980s. You've got source countries that provide these foreign fighters. You've got transit hubs, which are safe havens, train, recruit, arm, equip, indoctrinate. They go and hit targets. Those that are left over at the end that either survive the battlefield uh, or, or just happen to get lucky uh, cycle back to wherever, whatever country they come through. So it started in the 80s. Everybody goes to Afghanistan, they cycle back out. Al-Qaeda becomes, you know, the transit hub that keeps everybody together. Train, recruit, indoctrinate, cycle them back out, 9-11. Iraq and Afghanistan, round two. You could see this happening. And so in 2009, I was writing about foreign fighters, and you could see what I, I call now the era of terrorism competition emerging, where you've got a lot of small jihadi groups that are all out there. They have uneven communication with AQ Central. Some have strong, tight bonds back to AQ Central, what, what is left of them. Others are weakly aligned, and that's what you see with the dynamic with AQ and Iraq, AQ and Iraq right now. They've always kind of been pursuing their own agenda. Their connections have been lighter. And as time goes on, when bin Laden dies, you've got Zawahiri in, in, in Pakistan. There is no real center. People start discovering their own resources, right? So you have these affiliates, which are recruiting foreign fighters, and they're mostly empowering themselves with illegitimate funds. They set up their own black market systems. They come up with their own funds. And as they go and build, once they get success, what do they do? They start attracting donors. If you're an AQ affiliate and you've attracted foreign fighters and you have your own illicit funding mechanisms and now you're attracting your own donors, do you need to listen to the boss anymore, especially if you've never met him and you have very little communication with him? You look at AQIM and some of their documents that have been discovered, they talk about, hey, we sent you know, messages back to bin Laden and Zawahiri. We never heard back from them. When we did, it was many months later. You see you know, documents un uncovered in Cairo for a cell there. It says, hey, thanks for sending the money via Yemen, but it wasn't enough. We need more to keep going. So over time, what happens is if you have less communication, you have no resources coming from the center, you're on your own and you start moving your own direction and you get competition. And so in 2009, you could see these foreign fighters migrate out. And what happens? They each start doing their own operations. What do they do? They start local, build local support. Local support also closely related to building own, their own local resources. Where does this happen at? We see it in Somalia, right? Remember, it's always the CNN headline. Somalia is the next front in the war on terror. It's the worst thing ever. Six months later, OK, Somalia is over Yemen. Everybody remembers here in Africa, Yemen is the worst thing ever. We'll never survive. It's going to be the worst thing ever. Yemen goes down a little bit. What's next? Mali. Oh, Mali is the worst thing that ever happened on the planet. It is the largest 
caliphate ever, never mind the fact that it is a big empty pile of sand for the most part with a few guys in trucks driving around in the middle of the desert and is a very hard and difficult place to plan global operations from. Never mind all that, it's the biggest thing ever, boom, it kind of goes down, the French intervene. See it in Libya, right, everybody's seen the story. There's always guys marching, there's somebody crawling under barbed wire. You know, it's a terrible story. There's only one place this is stuck, and that is Syria. You see the blip up, down, up, down, up, down. And what is the variable with Syria? We're not doing anything about it, right? There is no global counterterrorism effort. There is no U.S. plan. And so if you're a foreign fighter, you're fickle, you're 18 to 23 years old, you don't like supporting a loser, you want to support a winner, and you can see this in their social media. Molly, Molly, we should go to Molly two days later. Ooh, Molly's not going well. Hey, everybody, Syria's going great. Boom. Propaganda. Syria, 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 Syria. And where do you see the, the foreign fighter flow go? It goes to Syria. Why? Because you want to play for a winner. Why else? You start to see donor funds going there. You can see this, as Will said, on Twitter. You can see this in the open source. It's on Facebook. It's there. You don't have to search for it. And you can see this happening. The only somewhat positive thing, and it's not positive in, in the sense of what we want to see, you know, in our world, but it is the Serengeti right now, Syria is. Anybody seen the video where there's the lion attacking the antelope, and as he's attacking, he backs into the water, and an alligator or a crocodile, like, eats the lion? That's what we got going on in Syria right now. You got Kurds fighting jihadists, jihadists fighting jihadists, jihadists fighting the FSA, FSA fighting Assad, Assad fighting the jihadists, Hezbollah fighting the jihadists. Israel flies over, they hit a convoy, maybe it's Hezbollah, you know, we don't know. Okay, it is a complete battlefield right now. And there's lots of fractures, there's a lot of different directions this can go. What's interesting to look at is what audiences essentially support which one of those factions. And so when you look at social media for Nusra versus uh, ISIS, you see that the most people following it are in Saudi Arabia, five times more than any other country. And there are people in the same towns in Saudi Arabia following both, Nusra and ISIS. So they're all watching what's going on. Everybody's trying to decide which way they're going to go. And the funds are probably coming from those same locations. So it's an interesting dynamic that, we're going on, that is going on. We have lots of fracturing that's out there. The other thing that I think we need to look at is that you, if you want to know the operational strain of Al-Qaeda, and I dare you to ask anyone to define what Al-Qaeda is right now, especially a CNN journalist. If any of you ever get on TV, please ask him that, because I'd love to know. But if you watch what's going on in terms of the flow, the big operations are predominantly carried out with some sort of foreign fighter nexus. Westgate, the linkage in with Shabab, the linkage in with what was going on in Somalia was a foreign fighter strain. I'm sure Ikrima, you guys have seen the story, his time in Norway, he would moved around, he would worked through the diaspora community. They were supposedly going after him in Barraway. That is the foreign fighter strain. That is what, if there's anything that holds the group together, it's them, because they've joined for global objective, not for local objectives. This has always been the problem and challenge for Al-Qaeda when they try and network with local conflicts. This started back in the early 90s when they were in Somalia, and it's happening now in Syria, which is how do we blend our objectives with the local objectives, not get too derailed and burn up too much resources to get everybody to focus on the far enemy over the near enemy. Our goal, at least what I think one of our goals should be, is to keep that conflict going. And I'll, I'll kind of close with that at the end. But that foreign fighter strain, you see AQAP operatives are for the people that they're trying to find related to Benghazi. You see foreign fighters sort of connections going all the way through Somalia. You see it in Egypt right now. They're the strain that if there is any connection, if there is that communication and resource distribution or any control from Al-Qaeda, it's mostly going to come from foreign fighters. They're there for Al-Qaeda's big objectives. So when they get enmeshed in these local fights, they quickly sort of sour on it. They do, and Al-Qaeda has the benefit of recruiting from locals too. So they integrate with a group like Shabab or Nusra or ISIS. Any of those local militias around there, they sort of see who's most talented and most ideologically aligned with them, and they start to pull them in. So you become like an all-star team, you know, from the terrorist standpoint. You recruit and pick the ones that have the most talent or the skills that you need. So you can piece together a better team. So that's why foreign fighters are really going to matter. And that's why you're going to see when they start migrating back out, Europe being of greatest concern, but really you've got them from everywhere right now. 
that's going to be the third round that we see. That's where it will emanate from. And whether we're tracking that or not in a coherent way is going to be tough to figure out because we don't have that sort of dominance and we're not really actively countering terrorism the way we have in other theaters, which is why they're going there. So that's why Syria is a big focus. The other thing I wanted to bring up is why Syria is important in terms of foreign fighter context is because you see what I, I call foreign fighters going out of sector. So if you're, a, if you're seeing foreign fighters from Pakistan show up in Syria, I usually look or think that that must mean a couple things. One, if you believe in the big Al-Qaeda global, everything is linked into a giant conspiracy, that could mean, hey, these guys were dispatched out to this foreign fighter conflict, this affiliate, to join up with them to help them with logistics, planning, whatever they're deficient in. So that's one way to look at it. The other one to look at is there's not a lot of opportunity for a good jihad in Pakistan. And I know Syria is the place to go. And so I want to be with a winner, I move, and I join up with them. So there's two different ways to look for that. So when I'm watching the foreign fighter flow, something I always look for, are there people going from one conflict region that has plenty of opportunity to pursue jihad locally, but are then migrating to another theater to fight? Libya is a great example right now. There are lots of Libyans that are cycling to Syria. If there was a grand conspiracy of Al-Qaeda in Libya right now, would a lot of them really be cycling to Syria? Maybe that would take a lot of planning, kind of equivalent to like the Pentagon to get all of that to work out. I don't think Al-Qaeda has that right now. Maybe they do in places, bits and pieces, but it's uneven. So I think that's something important to look at and why Syria is so significant right now. The second one is if we know foreign fighters are the thread that sort of links all this global jihad together, if we know they're what keeps Al-Qaeda together, why are we not focusing on this? And I'll give you an example. Omar Hamami, one of the 10 most wanted terrorists, just killed right the week before Westgate by Al-Shabaab, his own group. Winner, winner, chicken dinner, right? I mean, this is what we want. We've been waiting for something like this to happen. This is CVE in a can. You just pop it open, boop, like it's ready to go. It's been going on for a year and a half. Nothing, nothing. We had two domestic CVE campaigns, big documents. We're going to keep these kids in Minnesota from going to Somalia and everything. Holy cow, this guy, he's put out his own videos for us. He's tweeted for 10 straight months since January, you've got enough CVE content right there to regurgitate to every vulnerable community in the United States. I have not seen one thing, not one thing, nothing. I have a credit card in my pocket. In two weeks, I could come up with my own CVE video featuring Omar Hamami and have it on Google. Every time you Google Jihad, it would show up. You type in foreign fighter, it could show up. And we're sitting around here in our country saying that we're serious about CVE. It's a joke. If, it, if we were at all serious about this, we would be using these opportunities because you have foreign fighters who have been betrayed by their own terrorist group that are telling us that it's all a big false lie. Like, why don't we use that? Ten months this has been going on in public. They kill him publicly. He produces pictures of himself being shot by his own terrorist group. What are we doing? This, I, I, it doesn't get any easier than this. Can of corn, fish in a barrel. What are we doing? Nothing. Same time. Same time Omar Hamami's killed, a British foreign fighter's killed. We could be doing this in Britain. There's an Egyptian with him. We could be doing this in Egypt. They're all indigenous counters to their own recruitments from their country. Why don't we do this? Maybe we need another 20-page paper on how to do CVE, right? Come on. We're, we're putting out strategy documents left and right. It's time to do something. And if we're not, then let's just stop doing it. Uh, this is a great opportunity. We, we can be using this day in and day out. We have Nusra and ISIS attacking each other in Syria where we know is the epicenter of jihad right now. I would not, I, I would have so many Google sponsorship links. Every time you type in Syria, I would have a video of an ISIS and a Nusra guy shooting each other. I would have every single diaspora community that there, we see a lot of recruitment from, which you can see on Facebook. Easy message. We don't even have to make it up. All we have to do is post the link. We can say U.S. government on it. 
We can mail it to them. We know where they live. We know their parents. We've gone and interviewed them. Nothing. We've done nothing. So we can't possibly be serious about CVE or countering foreign fighter flow or we would have done these things by now. That's what I must believe. So if any of you are in U.S. government or working with them, it's easy to do. You can do it for a few thousand dollars on a credit card. Okay? So I, I think we're just totally throwing away a great opportunity right now. There haven't been so many public and visible fractures at any time that I've been watching this terrorism stuff. Which brings me to my larger point, which is, you know, what's our strategy moving forward? And this is kind of where I'll conclude. Two things. We need to shape rather than dominate. We've been in 10 years of the dominate role. So we're in Iraq or Afghanistan. We're doing military operations globally. We're hunting these down, guys down and kill them. Okay, great. I'm all for it. Okay? To me, winning in, in terrorism, there is no end. There is no beginning. You want to be eliminating terrorists at a faster rate than they are created. That is winning. This will go on for all of our lifetimes. In order to do that, we aren't going to be able to go to every country, occupy them, set up democratic institutions, and make peace. We can't do it. We've tried. It's been going on for 10 years. But we can shape the landscape. We have a lot of other tools that are out there. So changing our mindset about CT, I think, is important in this next era. The last one, then, is influence rather than occupy. We're not going to go into Syria. And if we were seriously going to back one entity or another, we probably had to do it a year and a half ago, right? But we had election coming up. We had other things. We were still dealing with Libya. There were a lot of conflicts going on. So now we really, really have to be nimble. And we really, really have to use our influence and other capabilities to do CT. I really think the foreign fighter pursuit stuff that's going on is great. Seeing dual raids in Libya and Somalia, I think that stuff's fantastic. But there's got to be other options out there, too. And working with partners, I think, is important. Number one, the, the Saudi Arabia thing, I think, is very key. The money's been coming there. And for every foreign fighter conflict, the number one producer is Saudi Arabia. So we know where they're coming from. So what are we going to do? All right. Thanks, Clint. Barack? It's always hard to uh, follow these guys. Uh, this is my second time speaking immediately after Clint. And I should have learned. Uh, and I don't even have a suit to make up for. <laughs> but uh, I will try to. Uh, make a contrarian argument. I will try to argue that while the question of the war in Syria is extremely important, uh, and uh, I think that uh, requires serious attention from the, the US, the question of the foreign fighters is probably uh, somewhat uh, overblown, at least with regard to the implications for uh, the US and the West. Let me start just being the academic uh, here, just to say a few things about what I think are some of the conceptual ambiguities. I will try not to say too much. I've done that before. So first of all, the first point is that not all foreign fighters are the, the same. And we need to, uh, when we get a strategy one day, maybe, hopefully, uh, I hope that we will be able to identify that um, we need to have to differentiate between different actors. If you look at the war in Afghanistan during the 1980s, most of the foreign volunteers that came to the arena didn't even think about participating in fighting. Um, you have uh, logistic, you have health, there are lots of other things that you can do in the arena. And some of them might pose danger later on, some of them do not. Another issue is that not all jihadis have uh, hate the West, and not all foreign volunteers are actually jihadis and uh, follow an extreme extremist ideology. Some of them might learn that ideology as they're actually participating in the conflict. But many of them, as Will said, are people that look at the fate of co-religion, uh, of members of the religion, and see that nobody is doing much to war anything to really help them, and they feel the need to do something to help. And if it wasn't 
about helping Sunni Muslims, I think that we probably would have looked at uh, this kind of assistance in a more positive way. Uh, but it is Sunni Muslims, so we don't look at that uh, this way. Now, some of those people do end up, or most of them do end up with jihadi organizations, but they do that because the other organizations in the Syrian arena don't seem to have the infrastructure to absorb and to take in the foreign volunteers. So in some ways, maybe if those other organizations had better mechanisms to accept foreign volunteers, maybe the foreign volunteers that are not, uh, that don't have the jihadi inclinations, would not have gone to the extreme and get, uh, and, and, and get uh, to adopt these kind of ideologies. Finally, there is the issue of geographical uh, definition. What do we count when we speak about foreign fighters. Remember in Afghanistan uh, during the 1980s, almost everybody was actually in Pakistan taking action out of Pakistan. Do we look only at people that are in the Syrian arena? Do we look at as foreign fighters, the people that are operating uh, outside the borders in Turkey, uh, on the borders of Syria? Do we go to Europe or to the leaders of the recruitment rings uh, and look at them as foreign fighters. So all these are serious conceptual problems. Let me just add, last one, question of individuals versus groups. Uh, we tend to focus on individuals when we think about foreign fighters. I think that the main issue of foreign fighters in uh, Syria is actually the question of the groups, the fact that ISIS managed to make the transition across the border into Syria is a very serious issue with regard to foreign fighters. So far, every time that there were foreign actors trying to take over violent conflict in a neighboring state, they ended up, as Clint said, uh, shooting themselves in the leg by getting into conflict with the local population. If ISIS will do better, we see already that uh, ISIS is trying to learn from the mistakes of the, that it made in Iraq uh, in the previous decade, then we have a much more serious problem. Going on with groups, I would like to echo what uh, uh, Will said about the importance of paying attention to the Shiite groups, that uh, Shiite foreign fighters that come into uh, that come into the Syrian arena. Why aren't we afraid of the Shiite foreign fighters? And I think at this point, to uh, the couple of hypotheses that we can suggest, maybe the fact that they usually come in groups that are more organized, maybe because we think that they are controlled by actors that uh, we have other tools to fight. Not that we're going to do that, but on its face, if we can say those are uh, linked to the Iraqi regime or are linked to the Iranian regime, then the way to deal with those actors is through those governments. And maybe we think that because of that, we can actually deter those actors and therefore their impact will be less significant. Whichever the reason is, I think that it shows that we have some bias. When we think foreign fighters, we think about jihadi, Sunni Muslims, we don't think about Shiites, and maybe it's time to call it the way that it really is. And the foreign fighters, the, the Shiite foreign fighters, are going to have adverse effects. Just think about what happens when you empower uh, Shiite foreign fighters that then go back to Iraq and what it means to the increased chaos inside Iraq. So it's not that those are insignificant aspects. Next, I want to address the role of the U.S. in creating that threat of foreign fighters. The, f the fact that the West neglected to intervene in the civil war in Syria early on meant that there was a significant opening for other actors to get in. It legitimized, uh, made more sense for religious scholars to call fighting in Syria defensive jihad that every Muslim has to uh, live 
all that he's doing and to go and help his brethren in Syria. The reason why you need defensive jihad is because there was nobody to help the people fighting inside Syria. So when the U.S. decided it does not want to intervene in Syria, it had to take into account, I'm not sure it did, but it had to take into account that the ramifications of that is that it created an opening, it created a need for foreign actors to play that role instead. And of course, when state don't take the lead in dealing with security questions, questions of international security, there will be non-state actors that will fill the vacuum. And in some ways, what we're seeing is another aspect of uh, the self-fulfilling prophecies that uh, came from uh, this administration regarding Syria, where the fear of weapons going into those uh, jihadi groups meant that the U.S. is not going to intervene, which meant that we're going to have a lot more role for those jihadi actors, uh, and therefore now a good reason not to intervene. There is a serious threat from foreign fighters to some countries. I will definitely admit that. Iraq and Lebanon are the main actors that are really affected by uh, foreign fighters. The fact that ISIS had Syria now, it has a territory in Syria to fall back on, this is significant for events in Iraq. So while the uh, ISIS was, or the ISA was getting stronger in Iraq already, the existence of safe haven in Syria and don't doubt what they have in Syria is a safe haven that is more significant than the safe haven that Al-Qaeda had in Afghanistan, which was one of the reasons why the U.S. went to war there, uh, and more significant than the potential threat of safe haven in Iraq, which was one of the reasons why uh, the U.S. went to war there. A significant serious threat to Iraq and Lebanon. But I think that the threat to the West is overblown. Experienced fighters rarely come from the West. Most of the people that come from the West to fight jihad in Syria are inexperienced. Now in the past, definitely in Iraq, most of them were for one-time use, which meant that usually they did not have a difficult uh, there, wasn't, there weren't serious repercussions because there was nobody really to go back. We need to figure out what the foreign volunteers are actually doing. Uh, we're not even sure to what extent ISIS is engaged in fighting the Syrian regime versus just managing the territory that it has under control. We are not even sure at this point whether ISIS agenda is really to fight the civil war in, uh, in Syria in order to topple Assad or in order to cement that safe haven that it has in Syria. Looking back to Iraq, we see that despite all the warnings, there were no significant threats coming from Iraqi, from foreign fighters that went to fight in Iraq. In fact, most of the attacks that were planned and uh, most of them fortunately uh, were prevented came from homegrown terrorists that were very unhappy about U.S. policy regarding Iraq. So in some ways, the threat of the threat to the West is less from the foreign fighters going to Syria, but it's more from the perception of how the West is dealing with the Syrian crisis that will then translate to homegrown terrorism. We should also think about why would jihadis after Syria go against the US or the West? Now there are so many other potential places. They can go and fight in Sinai. They can go to uh, North Africa. There are plenty of places where they can fight. On its face, there are lots of other places that they can go. The goal is not the U.S. The U.S. was supposed to be the goal for jihadis to establish a caliphate in the Middle East. If the regimes in the Middle East are considered weak, 
then on its face, Al-Qaeda and its affiliates don't need to go and attack in the West in order to achieve their goals in the Middle East. They can just go and fight in the Middle East. I mentioned the problem of homegrown terrorism as more important than uh, the question of foreign fighters. And on its face, so far we could have said the U.S. really just stayed outside of this conflict for most of the time and therefore didn't create a reason for foreign fighters to go and target the U.S. But if uh, you know, we all were fascinated by the New York Times story today about uh, the administration's uh, mishandling uh, of uh, a serious strategy, and if there is anything that is likely to lead people to try to attack the West and uh, the U.S. especially, is to see the cynical way that the U.S. treated the conflict in Syria and the uh, disrespect that maybe for strategic reasons maybe was good, I don't think so, but the disrespect to human life in Syria that made this administration think that it's not a bad thing that the conflict will just go on. The problem is that now this story is out there and now there are enough people that can be very mad at the US for letting people die in Syria and that likely to be a more significant reason in creating a terrorist threat in the US than foreign fighters. I want to mentioned the threat of trapping uh, also when we think about people that go to fight in Iraq if we will immediately try to uh, think about them as a threat to the US and the West that means that immediately anybody that goes to those arenas need to be arrested once they come back I think this is wrong many people go to those jihad arenas and they see what actually is happening again as Clint said and are uh, extremely disillusioned. But many of them are then trapped. They can't really go back because they will be arrested. We need to have a very nuanced plan that will allow us to distinguish between those that wanted to help the uh, Muslim brothers in Syria and those that really represent a threat. Not every foreign fighter is a threat. What can the U.S. do besides that? There is no foreign fighters without external resources. So prevent financing. That mostly relates to Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states. Now much of the money that is going now, because there are U.N. Security Council resolutions that made the official channels, banking channels, much more difficult for money transfers, most of the money is arriving in bags through couriers and there is lots of money that is going. The Gulf countries, in order to stop the financing of foreign fighters, they need to take action. But in order for them to take action, they need to feel either the pressure of the U.S. or a wish to please the U.S. or probably a combination of both. As we see in the news recently, this is not exactly what the Gulf states have in mind when they look at the actions of the U.S. And so there needs to be some serious discussion, and the U.S. will need to also satisfy some of the wishes of the Gulf states. There are no foreign fighters if you seal the borders. The border with Iraq is a problem. The border with Lebanon, less a problem because from the Sunni side because Hezbollah is trying to police the, the borders but the main border is a problem is Turkey and Turkey did very little to seal that border. You need to also offer real support for non-jihadi groups. Lots of battalions are shifting loyalty according in just in response to where the money is. Make sure that the money is with the actors that you want to support. We, have the, we are inclined to think that Saudi Arabia is supporting the most extremist groups among the uh, Syrian rebels. This is not the case. Saudi Arabia is actually uh, supporting, is not supporting ISIS. And I think that if the U.S. will show 
willingness to provide serious support for the more moderate actors in the Syrian arena, Saudi Arabia will go along. Saudi Arabia made sure, or at least tried to make sure, that most of the resources that it's investing is not going to those actors, as opposed to Qatar that, was, that went for the more extremist groups. Finally, maybe we should think about something of the Bosnian solution. When the Dayton Accords were signed, part of the deal was that the Bosnian government will have to get rid of the foreign fighters. One problem with this is that you need to think, where would the foreign fighters then go? In some ways, kicking out foreign fighters from Bosnia helped Bosnia, but sent them elsewhere. Foreign fighters that went to fight in Afghanistan during the 1980s found in the beginning of the 1990s when they wanted to go back home, many of them to live in peace, that they don't have any place that they can go and live in peace because they will be immediately arrested. So it's important to think about ways that some of the fighters in Iraq that would like to be reintegrated to society can actually have a way to do so. And I'm done with that. Thank you. Okay, before we open it up to Q&A, Will or Clint, did you want to respond to anything briefly that you heard? You go, you were writing, I have to think. <laughs> because I can't think I write. So um, the only thing I would say um, in, in to address the, you know, inexperience uh, doesn't equal dangerous, I disagree with. Um, I Not think necessarily. Right. And so that's why uh, foreign fighters, I mean, let's shoot straight. A lot of the foreign fighters, especially from the West, that go to join these jihads are not super bright. And they get there and they get either disillusioned or wrapped up in something they don't quite understand. And so they become easy cannon fodder. There's a reason a lot of the kids from Minneapolis that went to Somalia ended up being suicide bombers. Because they, they couldn't do much else, right? I mean, if you're, if you're the leader of one of the groups that gets these foreign fighters in Somalia, and they show up, and you're like, hey, what can you do? And they're like, well, I'm, I'm pretty good with a computer, and uh, I got some shoes, and that's about it. And you go, okay, can you handle a weapon? No. Can you uh, plan an ambush? Can, have you ever fought in a battle before? Can you survive on your own out in the woods? Can you uh, organize and work well with people you don't know the language? Hey, you know what? We do have a job for you. It's called Suicide Bomber. Okay? Same thing happens. One of the main reasons, at least in my belief, that Zawahiri pushed the merger between Al-Qaeda Central and Shabab after bin Laden's death was because he wanted access to Westerners who could gain access back in to the West to execute an attack on the West. That you, all you need them to be able to do is get through a checkpoint. Abdul Muttalib, highly inexperienced, on an airplane. Thank God he was inexperienced. Couldn't detonate that bomb, right? So inexperience doesn't equal not dangerous. Um, I think they can get pushed into a lot of you know frames where they're used by dangerous people for dangerous reasons. So that's that's one bit of caution I think in terms of the foreign fighter stuff. Yeah, I really appreciated both of the presentations. Um, and I like particularly how Barack, you know, you, you, I think you nuanced it properly um, in, 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 in the way that we should think about the foreign fighters. But let's, let's accept all of your nuance. Let's say it's, it's all correct. Um, and let's also say conservatively that, you know, you can, bearing in mind the nuance, that you can take half of these foreign fighters off the table. That still leaves you between 3,500 and 5,000 foreign fighters that are a real threat. And that's only in year two. And nobody thinks this conflict is going to draw to a close soon. Um, it's, it's, that rate is going to ramp up. That's with the nuance. Uh, the other part of it is um, on, the, on the funding, um, it, is, it is certainly the case that the foreign funders are a major problem, the private donors. Uh, had the West, and particularly the United States, acted earlier uh, to provide money and arms through a centralized military command, um, it would have made a difference. Uh, it's too late now. The United States doesn't want to do it. Saudi Arabia seems to be sick of it. 
Um, the both U.S. and Saudi seem to be losing confidence in the Supreme Military Council. Um, I, I think that the fact that you saw this new Jaish al-Islam emerge, uh, which was a rebranding of an old brigade, uh, but the fact that you hear Saudi's name kind of echoing around this new brigade gives you, I think, a better sense of how they've decided to play this from now on. They followed the U.S.'s lead for two years, not giving heavy weapons, trying to push things through the FSA. I think the time has passed, and Saudi's going to start funding some of the more uh, Islamist groups that are successful on the battlefield. They're not going to fund ISIS. They're not foolish. Um, but neither are they going to try and uh, push forward this idea that there can, that, that there can be a, a secular face to this revolution. That, that, that time has, has passed, and I don't think, I mean, I would wish it to happen too, but I think as a policy recommendation, I, I think the ship has sailed, and, and no more are you going to see efforts to try and uh, build up the Supreme Military Council. I want to make just uh, two additional comments. Uh, one, ransom money as a, a way to finance terrorism. Um, as we, uh, there is a good chance that we gonna see more uh, foreign aids, uh, foreign aid workers, uh, Westerners in general being kidnapped in the region and ransom money then going back to fund those uh, the, the, the groups that kidnapped those actors, we need to be extremely careful and remember that paying ransom for people kidnapped in uh, by such groups actually fund their operation. And so we need to be careful that we're not trying to block funding from uh, one direction only to actually support these groups from another. A second point concerns uh, Israel. Uh, we'll mention the uh, attraction of the jihadi arena in Syria because it, Syria borders, uh, uh, borders Israel uh, through the Golan Heights. And I would like to just uh, point to a, there is an Israeli policy that I'm trying to figure out what's really going on. We keep seeing in the Israeli uh, news reports about uh, trickling of uh, injured Syrians that are being treated in Israel. I've never seen any explanation for what are the criteria for bringing those people in uh, and what is Israel actually trying to do. Uh, maybe it's uh, trying to create some kind of a fence similar to the fence that Israel had with Lebanon that allowed some kind of interaction with the people on the other side of the border. So it might be that uh, Israel is trying to uh, address the threat of foreign fighters getting too close to the border by creating some kind of connection with the groups operating close to the border, making sure that uh, they will be the good guys, not actors that might be threatening to Israel. But as I said, uh, we really don't know anything about that at this point, and I'm going to be, uh, I'm very intrigued to uh, figure out what's really the policy uh, behind it. So uh, one thing I, I did want to add about uh, resource distribution, because I, I kind of brought it up, but you know, I don't want to be a panelist that's always talking about problems and pointing out flaws and then not recommend things. So in terms of resource distribution, that should, in the Syria case, I think that's our number one CT priority. It is one way where we can influence the battlefield if we can't dominate it. And so I think there's a couple things we, we want to do. We want to keep those jihadist groups competing rather than coordinating. So what helps them coordinate? consolidated resource distribution. That's what Al-Qaeda did. That's what Peshawar, you know, the Service Bureau, that's what that was all about. That's part of the reason the ideological adherence and the, and the uh, you know, global objectives were always sort of focused was because resources were distributed in accordance with that, whether that was just money or training, logistics, other things. 
So one thing is don't let Al Qaeda Central regain control of the resource distribution. So it, it goes both ways. You know, if we can't control it going into Syria, we want to make sure Al Qaeda Central doesn't regain control of it. And I think that's a lot of the battle that you see going on right now between ISIS and, and Nusra is who can sit on top of that resource, personnel, money, logistical support, weapons, everything that's coming in there. So if you can gain, if you can keep any one entity from keeping control of that, that will probably keep those groups competing. And then number two is to bring the levels of resource support for those groups down overall. And if you see them starting to get along, or if you see one Nusra, ISIS going up or down, you start constraining on them and you try and balance it out. That's what I was meaning by shape rather than dominate. We don't really have the ability or capacity to, but we do have the ability to shape a lot of those functions. I think about how resources are going in, which is one thing that we're good at. Great. So before we uh, open it up, I'm going to take my role as moderator to uh, pose the first question. And it's for this for the panel. So we've talked a lot about the sectarian nature, about inflow and outflow issues, uh, but we haven't really talked about how this is how the situation in Syria really today is in many respects a proxy war uh, between Iran and the Gulf states. But on the on the Sunni side, you also have these competing interests. Qatari interests are different than Saudi interests. Saudi and Qatari interests are different than Turkey's interests. And Turkey uh, has basically turned a blind eye. I've heard reports that guys flagrantly guys who are coming to fight arrive at Turkish airports and are basically whisked to the border with no sorts of uh, sorts of issues. I mean, even even the Syrian government during the heyday of Iraq, the Mukbarat sometimes even hassled these Sunni extremists who were transiting their territory. But Turkey seems to have kind of turned a blind eye on this. So how much do you think possibly could create more tension in the future uh, between different groups based on sort of the geopolitical uh, interests of each of these each of these different regional powers. Uh, I've seen. I think you've all seen Dexter Filkin's article on uh, on Qasem Soleimani, and uh, there's been some other things about Turkish intelligence and the Saudi intelligence angle. And also, you have the Kurdish issue. There's been some battles between the Peshmerga and some of the ISIS guys on the border. In fact, in one of those attacks, uh, a guy from Pittsburgh's uh, passport was recovered on the scene. Uh, so, so, uh, and a, one of the, kind of the big fears I would assume is Americans that are going with the golden passport, going to a place like Turkey, um, and going in, fighting, getting some OJT, going back out, and then, you know, causing problems down the road. But I'll just open that up to the panel. I'd say just to speak to a part of it because there's all kinds of different factions competing with one another. Uh, I, I think last year the rivalry among the Sunni regional powers was much more intense than it is today, uh, particularly between Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Uh, the Qataris had their own proxies they wanted to work through. Saudi had theirs. Because of the leadership transition in Qatar, it seems to be that there is a pause right now in terms of their foreign policy. Uh, with regards to Syria, and they've kind of allowed the Saudis to take the lead. I'm not sure where they're going to come out on the on the other side of it. If they're going to uh, continue to defer to the Saudis uh, or not, but I but I actually think that dynamic has shifted a bit, and Saudi clearly among the regional Sunni powers has the has the um, has the portfolio. And as you say, um, Turkey has kind of opted out by this point in, in terms of uh, really trying to shape uh, the, uh, the nature of the factions beyond their border. I think they're very interested in you know, making sure certain people are in charge of brigades along the border, but I think beyond that it's sort of in, in Saudi's hands. I think that Turkey is uh, waking up to the her, it's been mishandling of the uh, Syrian situation. And we saw just a few days ago that uh, Turkey, for the first time, shelled uh, 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 jihadi uh, location uh, just uh, inside of Syria, close to the border. So uh, Turkey is aware now uh, that uh, there is a price to its policy. 
Now, the border is really long and it's really hard to defend, but Turkey didn't do anything to really protect the border. And maybe now it has self-interest in doing more. Uh, with regard to the different regional actors, uh, I agree with Will that Qatar is less important uh, at this point. Our three presentations, we hardly said anything about the real elephant in the room in Syria or in the Syrian arena, which is Assad. And on its face, uh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia both want Assad gone. If we can find a way to get rid of Assad, I think that both Saudi Arabia and Turkey will sign on to that and will overcome the differences that they have. I'm going to talk about one that's different, and that's Jordan. Uh, Jordan has been, you know, an integral counterterrorism partner for the U.S. since 9-11. Um, it sort of survived the Arab Spring in the sense that, you know, it wasn't toppled in the, in the same way as a lot of other regional partners. They've got, what is it, 100,000 refugees who have flooded, you know, across the border. That way they're, more. Yeah, way more than that now. I think that was, who knows how many. But the, the issue being that they're an essential, you know, partner for us. They've stood by the U.S. for, you know, thick and thin in a lot of different ways. They've got a lot of capability. They could be, uh, you know, a country that sort of shapes the way the Middle East goes in the future. Um, that is the one that is most concerning to me in a lot of ways, kind of like Tunisia and North Africa. It has a similar ba balance. So I think the way we sort of treat them as a partner and vis-a-vis, -vis, I'll be interested to see, like, as Saudi has sort of come out this week and said, oh, you know, the U.S., you're betraying us. Um, I, I'm really curious to see kind of what happens with Jordan going through. I don't know what will happen, but I think that's something we really need to look at long and hard. There's been a lot of talk about Turkey, 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 but I think we sometimes forget that Jordan uh, is an essential partner for us on, on counterterrorism throughout the Middle East. Yeah, Major General Nagata just gave an interview with uh, the Tampa Tribune where he talked about kind of working with them through CENTCOM um, on some of those issues. Okay, we're now to Q&A. Please queue up at either microphone. Uh, FPRI follows Jeopardy rules, so if you have a speech, please make it in the form of a question. Sir. Oh, one reason uh, that might be treating foreign fighters is because uh, I'm on the committee. I want to pick up on one of your points and add it to the list of three reasons why, why jihadists might be fighting. There's a fourth reason, and it's because of this safe haven. Men who would otherwise be targets of Spetsnaz forces or SEALs or predator drones can go to Syria, carry on the cause, and be completely safe. And that, that needs to be explored because our administration has created the safe haven by not carrying predators' operations out of Incirlik to get rid of these guys. And so I, I just want to raise the policy question is it time to revisit the safe haven, which by default is created uh, in Syria, despite the fact that revisiting that policy might actually aid Assad? If you're looking for the interests of the United States to get rid of guys who have killed our people, then we have to revisit that policy. I think it will be ironic. Uh, and said if the U.S. will intervene in Syria because of a safe haven that it helped creating um, after tolerating the death of uh, 100,000 people, probably a lot more, uh, the U.S. might end up deciding to do so, but it's really sad that the damage, the suffering in Syria is not enough the risk of a potential of the consequences of a safe haven in Syria might actually do the trick. No, just a targeting of selected individuals. Um, I, I, I take I take your point about about safe havens. Um, it is 
attractive for jihadis, I think, to go because they don't have to worry about things flying overhead necessarily from the United States that would be good at tracking them. Um, I, I don't know that we could deploy drones in that environment. I mean, the things are pretty slow moving. They might got, get shot down. It is an act of war if we invade Syrian airspace. So I, I don't know if that would be the right way to, to handle those safe havens. But you're, you're, you're certainly correct that it is an, an attractive environment for that reason. I'm with you. I, I've been railing on this for a couple of years. And my, my blog is Selective Wisdom. I write for Mike at FPRI. And I wrote a post probably, I don't know, nine months ago, counterterrorism and hot dogs, don't tell us how it's made. Well, Americans uh, don't want to know. And as soon as they do, they don't like it. We have no detention policy. I, I don't believe in Gitmo. I'm glad it's being closed. We have no detention policy. We don't do black sites. Every counterterrorism operation we do, we suddenly don't like it later. We did black sites, we don't like it. We did Gitmo, we don't like it. We did drones, we don't like that. We did surveillance, oh no, we can't have surveillance. So what is left? What is left is what has been put forth, right? We'll kind of give some guys some leftover nods we got in an old Connex and some MREs and we'll hope that our counterterrorism objectives are met because we've constrained ourselves on a lot of things. And this isn't all the administration's fault. I, I mean, one of the things that I actually really enjoyed that was trying to be pursued was the disposition matrix. Essentially, let's build a strategy globally to pursue counter, uh, to pursue terrorists that makes sense. And we use those options that we have that are available depending on what country the terrorist goes to and what our interests are and how much risk we want to take. I thought that was a very sensible approach. Of course, they got bashed on both sides, right? On the left, they didn't like it because it was too aggressive. On the right, they didn't like it because it wasn't aggressive enough or something. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Everything is kind of taken off the table. And so when it, the further we get away from 9-11, the more tools we take off the table and we back ourselves into a corner where we have very limited options. The reason we're not intervening in Syria is because we realize after Libya we can't keep control of everything the way we would really like. And it opens up a lot of can of worms. I'm with you. We, we're, we have let this be a safe haven and that's why they're going there. Just like the French did in, in Western Africa. The same problem as what the French did. They ended up paying kidnapping ransoms to AQIM for three years so they could only go in and invade Mali. That, uh, we do it time and again. So, yeah, it's an issue. I don't know that drones are the answer, but I do know that consecutively over the past two years, as our country has come to learn how we've done counterterrorism, counterterrorism options that have pulled us out of battlefields in Iraq and Afghanistan and long-term occupations that have cost us a fortune, we've systematically taken off the table every counterterrorism tool that was highly effective at killing Al-Qaeda. So until we figure out as a nation what we're really acceptable to, I don't think we'll be able to move forward. And Syri in places like Syria will continue to fester. In 10 years, we're going to be having a conference talking about the effects of Syria and why we didn't do anything. Yeah. Sir, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ahmad Bitar. I'm, um, I, um, I just arrived from Syria like one month ago in a scholarship funded by U.S. Department of State. My city is Aleppo, so you can imagine what's happening there. Name uh, each group and you'll find it there. I get the chance to, to meet with many foreign, foreign fighters. Uh, actually, I spoke to many of them, and what uh, Mr. McCann said was uh, very, uh, very reasonable. I, I, heard, I heard that from their mouth. Actually, I have two questions for you, if you can help me with uh, answering it. The first one is I noticed that, uh, let's say that the regime uh, in his war against uh, those uh, f foreign fighters, like as if he's directing a movie or, or a, a battle, like if he wants to deliver this area, he will give it to them. If he, he, do, if he doesn't, no, no, no force on earth can make it happen. In my city, I'm living in the western side, which is seized by the regime. Although we are like an island in, in all radical Islamist groups, till now, after, after 15 months, they couldn't enter it. it. Although it's like the third part of the city, while the, 
sorry, while the opposite took over not the city, the two thirds of the city, the whole, the whole rural area. So there is some reports or theories said that in the beginning of the crisis, and uh, in order to to protect the regime, to, uh, to let the regime protect himself, he set free by amnesty, the, those amnesty from the president, many uh, Islamic leaders who captured them in 1980, uh, in 2008 and 2009. One of them, like this now, is Al Jolani, which is now is the prince of Al Nusra. So it's, uh, he put the Syrian now between two choices, like uh, either me, the bad regime, or other the worse option. Many people, including my mother, she's n not into politics at all, saying the regime is bad, but I prefer the regime much more than, much more than the radicals. So what do you s say about this theory? Is it the regime now is controlling? Not, I don't say that he's creating them, but let's say that he predicts that if he do this, the reaction will be like this. It's like a chess game. But he's, you know, he, he can do this. And the reason that came to my mind uh, yesterday or two days ago in the president's speech into Al Mayadeen, he looked very confident. Even the interviewer, interviewer say, said to him, you, you look very victorious. You, you, you're acting like you, you are a winner. Are you like this? So I think this kind of overconfidence, although he is also, he's all, uh, only controlling to 20, uh, 40 percent of the whole Syria, it's a little confusing. Like, is this running, he, is, he is running the game. So I need to find out your opinion regarding this issue. The second one is, uh, there is another theory that uh, saying that uh, the reason for, not, uh, uh, for the American not intervening in Syria is that they want to, to let's say, gather all the Mujahideen from all around the world and being killed by the Syrian army. Especially now, uh, after the regime, like the fr previous point, the first point, he, he managed to make the Syrian unite against, against, with him against those foreigners. And it's not like now a sectarian war. Let's say that many Sunni Muslims fighting with the regime because they are believing that they are fighting for Syria. I have many friends now in the Syrian army. They believe they are not fighting for the Assad or for the regime. They are fighting Syria against the, the foreign intervention, against Mujahideen, against all those people. So uh, I think the reason that uh, it's easier for the U.S. and uh, actually it's more, it's more economic for them to, to take this proxy killing, like let's make the Syrian government do the kill and in exchange we can live, uh, we can take, uh, make al-Assad president for like next seven years or next 14 years. And they can do all the fighting and can, they can all do all the killing and we, we become relieved in Afghanistan or in Pakistan because all these Afghani and Pakistani people are now fighting in Syria. And they are fighting also, they are coming from, from Libya. And we, if, if you hear the news now, uh, you will be hearing that n there is no much fighting in Libya as much as is in Syria. And many f Libyan fighters, like you said, they are now moving to, to Syria. Not because winning or losing, but actually that I think there is some kind of relieving for everybody. It's like win-win situation. The Americans now have no problems in uh, many countries, while the Syrian government, which is the bad, you know, the axis of evil, now taking care of it, you know, exhausting. And they are like... Uh, putting enough money and resources to be not ab able to do any part uh, regionally, like against Israel or against uh, okay. or with Iran or anything else. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm sorry for being so long in my speech, but thank you. I'll let you guys take this down. Um, I will answer the, the second question. Uh, first of all, it's always, uh, I'm always impressed by uh, theories that give the U.S credit for such sophisticated strategies. <laughs> um, I've been following, yeah. uh, I've been working on uh, such topics for 25 years now and I can't say that I will give such high marks for uh, uh, American strategy. As for the specifically to the question of bring all the jihadis to uh, Syria. The, wasn't that uh, one of the ideas about the Iraq war, let's fight them in Iraq, uh, kill them there? The, the U.S. figured out that it's not working, so I really don't think that that's what the U.S. is trying to do in Syria. Uh, I, I agree with Barack on the on the second question, that I don't think that's what the administration had in mind. I mean, I think as the 
the the was it New York Times article today? I think it's yeah, as the Times article made clear pretty clear today, I think the president just reflects the the nation's extreme reluctance to get involved in another war in the Middle East. I mean, that is after all what he the platform he got elected on and he got burned by the surge in Afghanistan was unhappy with the results in Iraq and I think that has much more to do with our reluctance to get involved than than a desire to to um create a epic battle between the Sunni and the Shia on your on your first question um uh I I think it's it's actually uh you know, people it may it may sound to the audience a little bit like a conspiracy theory you know the idea that Assad would let some of the jihadis go um uh for his own purposes but I I, I who knows right I mean at the leadership level if that kind of information we would never know if that was in his mind but but it is the case that Assad has done things like this in the past in the late 1970s early 1980s they clandestinely sponsored some of their own jihadist groups to attract in some of the fighters who were hiding out in Jordan so they could gun them down I mean it, you you should not put that sort of thing past this regime and there are also rumors that are extremely difficult to substantiate impossible to substantiate in the open sources but there are rumors um, among some of the activists on the ground you will hear that there there is a belief that some parts of ISIS have been penetrated uh, by the regime I I don't know if that is true or not all I am saying is I, I wouldn't put it past that regime they are quite clever in subverting these jihadi groups they have a long history of doing so just to add a, another possible example uh, Fatah al-Islam in Lebanon in Nair al-Badr uh, the, one of the uh, theories is that it was a group that was penetrated by Syrian intelligence. Now, that does mean that the foot soldiers are necessarily aware of that plan, but it's not beyond the regime. And the regime does have a way to uh, mitigate or, or, or shape the role of the jihadis. On its face, the regime can decide it doesn't need the rural part of Syria. It can't spread the forces everywhere. Therefore, it's better to give up on some territory. And if that territory is being penetrated by those actors that uh, Assad has been saying all along that are the enemy that he's fighting, definitely serves uh, uh, his goals. But this is not necessarily a, a matter of uh, conspiracy this is part of the strategy that Syria is is enacting that because there was a vacuum because there was no foreign intervention to stop the war and Assad was doing poorly he had to make decisions that definitely had impact on the presence of jihadi forces in Syria We have a first uh, a question from Twitter, uh, our first one for any of our events. So we've gotten to uh, 2011, I think. Uh, this question is from Aki Peretz, and I'm just going to um, just paraphrase it. He asks, is there any data that indicates whether people are going there to die or whether they're going there to fight and get experience to leave afterwards? Yeah. No, I don't know. I mean, it, we were lucky in the sense of Iraq that the Sinjar records um, came forward and you could see them sort of declare in their in administrative document, you know, I want to be a martyr, I want to be a fighter. So you could get a sense of like who maybe had an intention to go back if they made it versus those that were th really there to be suicide bombers. And then you could track that on the suicide bomber end as well. We We have not seen as many suicide bombers, so I would be inclined to say that a lot of them are going uh, and if they die, okay, you know, they achieve their goal, but if they don't, don't they're not going to, like, deliberately sacrifice themselves. They're more in a conventional conflict. The other nuance about the sort of ideological reasons and motivations for going is there's a lot more sectarian uh, propaganda that's mixed in with the Syrian uh, foreign fighter flow. So that would not necessarily, I, I wouldn't think necessarily be, primed as much towards suicide bombers. That's more of the force on force conventional kind of thing, which would, if there are, it's quite a meat grinder there. So the number of survivors may be a lot lower than other conflicts, but it would maybe suggest the intention to return, but I don't know the exact numbers. 
Sir. Hi, uh, Chris Blanchard with the Congressional Research Service. Next time I'll tweet my question and <laughs> I guess jump the line a little bit. Um, <laughs> Barack uh, talked about off ramps and Clint uh, was talking about Gitmo. Obviously, we've been talking about releasees from, from the region. Um, I want to invite the panel to sort of put forward uh, examples of um, some Gitmo folks that may be in the mix. We've heard reports from some of the Maghrebi uh, releasees, not just from Gitmo, but then also from Moroccan detention showing up in northern Syria. Uh, I'm curious about uh, Egyptian releasees, uh, guys detained in the 90s that may be active, and obviously the Saudi program. Um, those guys showed up in, uh, in Yemen. Are there prominent examples that we should be aware of? Uh, operating now uh, in uh, in Syria, and then I guess in a more broader sense, what does this say about detention uh, debates, about recidivism debates, de-radicalization debates, not just for the United States but for uh, governments in the region? Thanks. Do you know any? I don't know any specific examples. It must be there. Yeah, I don't. I. Sounds like you're better informed on the question of specific examples in Syria than, than I think. To be some Moroccan guy. Yeah. Uh, I think I, that's, but all that's, uh, that's all I remember was Moroccan guy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So there's a Moroccan guy. Um, <laughs> on, on the recidivism rates, um, yeah. It, 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 I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a subjective question in some ways, though. You know, I mean, if, if you have 5% of your graduates that get back on the battlefield, is that a failure or success? I, you know, I mean, it, it really depends. The other way you could look at it is, well, 95% of those guys didn't go back. I, I would see that as a, as a big win. But then again, 5% of, of those folks go through, they go back. You don't need a large number of people to do a lot of damage. So, so I, I, I guess a lot of it would depend on, on, on your perspective and also the, the political culture in the country and the risk that the country is willing to, to tolerate, the amount of risk. I mean, in the United States, if we had that kind of program and even one person went back to terrorism, I think it would just, the program would be judged an absolute failure because we have a very low threshold for risk. We have a super low threshold for anything, basically. <laughs> if anything ever happens, we've got to end the program immediately. And so we haven't had a detention policy for a long time. And for some reason, this has not fallen on the public that they get the reason drones are so appealing is because you don't have to detain anybody, right? I mean, have we not figured this out? It's not like we implicitly say, oh, well, if we kill them, we don't have to imprison them. It's just that the option has been taken off. You know, dating back to the end of the black sites, end of Gitmo, you know, we're trying to close it. We never, ever have gone back and said, okay, what are, uh, this is what I was meaning by the disposition makers. What are our options then? If we're going to detain somebody, how are we, are we going to prosecute them all in U.S. courts? There's, we've tried to go that route. One part of Congress or another is always blocking each other because, you know, we don't ever want to do anything, you know, in Congress for whatever reason. I, you know, we've never created a solution for how we want to pursue counterterrorism. And when the administration is trying to do things, like the disposition matrix can say, okay, when terrorists enter country X, we'll build relationships with law enforcement so we can detain and prosecute, we shut it down. So what happens? We, we have partners do prisons. And what happens when partners do prisons? We get jailbreaks, right? We got a whole string of jailbreaks just a few months ago. Zawahiri in his latest, you know, pronouncement says, hey, we should do jailbreaks because all these guys are just hanging out in jail and it's lightly controlled. So why don't we just go get all these guys back because those are our experienced guys that aren't killed by drones. <laughs> They're the only ones left that really know how to unite things. So why don't you go back and get them? This is an essential thing we have to figure out. How do we want to use these counterterrorism tools? You're exactly right. In terms of recidivism, there's always going to be recidivism. You know, how we are, what is acceptable, I think, is critical. What are we going to be okay with seeing in the future? I mean, DRAD, we're going to have to have some kind of program if we're going to do detention. And so if we don't have detention, we don't do DRAD. It just all feeds on itself, and we're just constraining ourselves over and over. One point about uh, rehabilitation programs. Uh, if you try to use the frame of terrorism, then, yes, people went back to engage in what we would term terrorist activity. But if the 
goal of the particular uh, rehabilitation program was to make sure that through, from an Islamic perspective, that you understand that you need to accept the authority of your state, that you uh, can only that there are certain limitations on or conditions under which it's legitimate to pursue jihad, then you can say somebody that came out of the uh, Saudi program and is going to fight now in Syria, not necessarily a problem of uh, recidivism, because right, he's not attacking the state, he's going to do something that the Saudi state at least uh, blind eye, but uh, if not support, supporting, and he's doing that for a cause that uh, got the support of the religious establishment. So this is not necessarily a problem of uh, recidivism. Okay. All right, so I'm going to get all crazy on detention here. But I, th there's another part of this when we're talking about shaping counterterrorism operations versus dominate. So foreign terrorists, we've been designating people as foreign terrorists. Everything for the past 12 years is we only escalate up and we never create options to negotiate to back down. So we're not real good about taking in defectors. It's tough for us. So our partners can sort of do defectors, but it's kind of tough for us. Case in point, Shabab over the past year has been fragmenting like crazy. You've got different factions. You have Godain, the leader, very tyrannical, way into violence, alienating locals. You've got Robo, also a foreign designated terrorist. You've got Awes, another guy who's got local popular support. They start to defect. Our hands are tied. We've designated them as foreign terrorists, and we can't back down off of that. When have we done that in the past? Very rarely. Usually there has to be a catastrophe like 9-11. That's when we backed off of Libya. If anybody remembers, we kind of like let Libya back in, only to, you know, hit them with a JDAM or two a few years later. But, I mean, you know, that was kind of our stance. When something happened, we kind of recalibrated. I think we've got to be a little bit more flexible and open and look at some of those programs that we pushed off the table, like bringing defectors back in. Algeria used breaking the GIA. One of the key things they did was dealing with defectors, having amnesty programs, those sorts of things. The U.S. has totally written that off the table. That's largely because the terrorists aren't from our own country, so we haven't had to deal with those problems. But I think those are things we need to look at how we balance with our partners. Sir. Thank you very much. My name is Edward Joseph with uh, Johns Hopkins SICE. Pleasure to be here today. You've got three experts here, Mike, who really know their stuff. Uh, I'd like to maybe direct this to William and, and Clinton, that uh, point that Barack made in his comments uh, about uh, ISIS or AQI learning from its mistakes in Iraq. And I, I, the way I'd like to frame the question is, uh, is, is this something like, are there limits to this? Is this something like the frog and the, the old story about the frog and the scorpion? Uh, for example, this report by Basma Kodmani uh, details recent examples of uh, conflicts between uh, the extremist groups in Syria and the democratic forces, and they're not fighting over tactics. I, I mean, it's ideology. And the reason they're there, they, they believe, they, they want a fundamentalist is, is Islamic State in, in Syria. That's what they stand for, and that's the issues that bring them into conflict with the local population. So how much can they really learn and still maintain, stay true to their values? The other point or question for Barack is, if I could just frame the question to you uh, differently. If you're not concerned about foreign fighters in Syria, what are you concerned about? I mean, Sunnis are upwards of 70 percent of the population, something like that. Uh, they're going to play a predominant role uh, for years to come. If we're not concerned about the influence of uh, foreign fighters affiliated in some form, directly or indirectly, with Al Qaeda, what, if we're not concerned about that, what, are, what should we be concerned about? That? Thank you very much. Yeah, so it's on, on the Nusra and ISIS question. Um, it, w it was interesting to watch early on uh, because you had Nusra um, uh, in the first year of the Civil War really embedding itself with the insurgency 
um, not being very strict about things like you know the local smoking cigarettes, that kind of stuff. The the ways that Al Qaeda in Iraq had gone very bad in 2006, 2007, and alienated the population, alienated uh, the other uh, factions of the insurgency. Nusra wasn't doing it, and those of us watching were like, oh, I guess I guess they learned their lesson. Fast forward a year. Um, where you have the split between Nusra and ISIS. Nusra still seems to be behaving fairly well in terms of embedding itself in the insurgency. It's ISIS that is misbehaving. ISIS that is breaking fingers in Syria if they catch you smoking cigarettes. ISIS that's clamping down if you're not properly covered up. Whoever is leading ISIS seems to have not learned the lessons of Iraq, and it's a it's a very pronounced split uh, between the the organizations. Not not just uh, not not over ideology so much as as how what kind of lessons they took from the from the conflict. So. Um to sort of plug a book that I've been reading right now that Will uh, can talk about it as well. One of our uh, colleagues when we were at the Combating Terrorism Center, uh, a guy named Jake Shapiro, who's at Princeton now, wrote a book called The Terrorist Dilemma. Fantastic book. And so one of the things that's in there, and, and I worked on a project with Jake called uh, Al-Qaeda's Misadventures in the Horn of Africa, is there's this constant tension about how do you get young people uh, to keep being you know, really zealous and energetic if you don't let them go kill people all the time. It's kind of a problem. It's this adventure seeking and I join jihad. Clint, I'll just mention that Jake Shapiro is speaking on behalf of FPRI tomorrow on that uh, book. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Good plug. Perfect timing. Um, and it's so how do you kind of control their violence in a productive way? If you're recruited off Facebook because you've been looking at all of these things, or you run into a former foreign fighter, you're joining because of the cool stories of what they went and did when they were in their jihad. And that doesn't involve hanging around and watching things happen around you and constraining your violence. So it's this real tension. I thought that was one of the dumbest things I read in Zawahiri's like, latest letter. He's like, and so to fight jihad, don't buy American goods. And it's like, Come on, I'm 22. I just got my AK-47. I'm not going to buy an iPhone. Like you're telling me, that's what the I didn't join for this. So it becomes this weird sort of you know issue. And you see, like Will talked about with ISIS, is very similar to what you see with a lot of the guys in Shabab. Is they go way overboard on the violence, way overboard to, to the point where it's counterproductive. And so how they manage that uh, is sort of intricate. They join to go fight. So if you don't let them fight. How are you going to keep them, you know, sort of in line and going in the same direction that you want to go? I think that ISIS is actually in a defensive mode because of exactly the things that uh, uh, are described in the, the terrorist dilemma. Uh, and if you look at statements that came from the uh, spokesman of uh, ISIS in the last few weeks, uh, there are some clear uh, instructions uh, not to do things that alienate the population. And you see ISIS is participating also, at least to a much larger extent than we saw in Iraq, uh, participating, trying to provide social services. I'm not saying that they are great at that, but you see in those statements that ISIS is trying to say, we can't control everybody. We're going to continue to see individuals violating the rules, and we will uh, do our best to address those problems. But this is not a systemic problem. This is a problem of individuals that are overzealous. And if you will give us the information, we will do our best to, uh, our best to deal with that. But we don't have uh, – this is not who we are. I think that there is a learning process. Some of those jihadi groups do it better than others. We saw that learning process already in Yemen. Um, again, th there is some uh, basic uh, problems that relate to the fact that you have uh, young people, and because people that are older and uh, smarter probably won't go and. Uh, find much fun in that kind of, uh, of conflict. Uh, so you, you, you have the problem of uh, young people, and you have the ideological issue. But the ideological issue, you can address it in very 
different ways. We're speaking about behavioral uh, restrictions. On its face, you can think about ways that you want to shape society to make it a more uh, Islamic society that will focus on education rather than on violence. And I think that some of those jihadi groups are trying to move in that direction. Again, they're not doing a great job, but breaking fingers is not necessarily the best way to Islamize society. You asked about what are my concerns. Uh, I have to say, as much as my writing is focused on the jihadi movement, when I look at Syria, I think that there are much more serious problems that we need to pay attention to. So the administration managed to dodge a, a bullet and not to have to actually carry out uh, an, an attack that uh, wasn't part of a real plan. But the Syrian problem is not going away. If Lebanon got an addition of about 25% to its population, this is a real problem. If Jordan uh, is so destabilized, if something will go wrong, it will go wrong very fast. If a refugee camp in Jordan is now the fourth or fifth largest city in Jordan, this is a problem that bothers me. Uh, I, I'm not even going to speak about the, the spillovers to uh, to Iraq, these are things that I think are a lot more important and then you have the whole potential for conflict with Israel. The, the, you think about sitting on a, a powder keg that is just waiting for that thing that will make the whole region explode and I don't think this is really the jihadis that are the center for that potential explosion. I think that the spillovers to other countries in the region, that's where the real problem lays, and this is something that the administration will not be able to always ignore. Okay. Sir. <clears throat> yeah, um, my question is just the, uh, I wonder if the panel could comment on the uh, position of the uh, Syrian Christians and the other non-Sunni groups, and also maybe explain why there seems to be a total lack of uh, publicity about uh, these positions uh, in this country. Um, it's it's not something I follow closely, um, but I do know that that a lot of the religious minorities in the country. Um, they don't want to align themselves with the regime. They're not fans of the regime. Um, but they also feel that as this conflict has gone on and become defined in more sectarian terms that they have no refuge but the regime. I mean, it's a, it's a sad place uh, to end up. Uh, but there it is. Um, and I, like I said, I think they're very reluctant supporters. They wish it were another way. But I think they see the ethnic and uh, sectarian cleansing that is going to come, and they're deeply, deeply fearful for their for their communities, and they are not rooting uh, for the Sunni opposition to win any longer when it's being defined in such sectarian terms. Christians have been leaving the Middle East uh, for over a decade now. Uh, soon there won't be uh, many Christians left. Uh, it's a uh, uh, it's said it's not unique to what's going on in Syria. We saw that, uh, especially in, in Iraq, uh, and we see the trend, uh, people leaving Lebanon as well. And so, uh, unfortunately, the problem of the Christian minority, at least, seems to be uh, getting slowly resolved in a very wrong way. I'll, I'll take a sort of unrelated view of that, and that's Western media um, isn't really covered from the position of religious interest writ large. You know, we don't have Christian newspapers or even Jewish newspapers or Muslim, uh, Islamic newspapers that dominate. We have CNN, you know, different kinds of media like that, whereas in the Middle East, a lot of the angles that are pursued, you know, from those media outlets, which cover a lot of those stories, and, and vice versa in the West, aren't just generally not interested in those topics. And just think about the feast that jihadis will uh, make on uh, 
publications in American media that speak about Christians and the need to save Christians. Um, that's going to be fascinating. Okay, we have a question from the web from Mark Vinson. <laughs> no, we have a lot of them, but no, we're not going to get to all of them. Uh, if a lack of U.S. involvement is considered a reason for foreign fighter interest in Syria, and how does that square with foreign fighter interest in Iraq and Afghanistan? Furthermore, what is the most effective approach that the U.S. can take to dissuade foreign fighter involvement in local conflicts? So the, the first part of the question is, I, I, get, I posited and Barack, same thing, that the, the fact that the United States wasn't providing any funding for the, uh, you know, some sort of centralized, more, more secular um, military apparatus that, that gave space to the Jihadis operating. The, the pushback is that, well, we did, we directly invaded in those other conflicts and it drew them there. But I think that's the distinction, right, is that invading a, a Muslim majority country is also quite attractive to jihadis. I, I don't think one rules out the other. Having us there is quite attractive, but having a vacuum where nothing is there is, is also quite attractive. So, yeah. Uh, what was the second part? The second part was... I just waited for you to pan yeah. What is the most effective approach that the United States can take to dissuade foreign fighter involvement? local conflict. Okay. So I have a few ideas on this. One, uh, make reality not turn out to be the dream. So that's the Omar Hamami story. I'm going to go join Jihad. I'm going to show up in Somalia. It's going to be fantastic. We're going to build a caliphate. I get there. It's a bunch of guys on trucks. They don't really like me. It's not so fun. No one listens to me. I'm not the center of the universe. I'm smarter because I'm pursuing ideological goals. The locals are just here pursuing clan issues. Getting all of that out in the public is a strong deterrent. As soon as Hamami's story came up and it kept festering and festering, and then you hear about the fractures that are going on, I'm convinced the foreign fighter flow to Somalia, which we were all so worried about whenever the Shabab AQ merger happened, really declined significantly. I think Nusra, ISIS is another opportunity like that. You know, anytime we can get that out there. The second one is we don't have, and, and this is something I pushed for a long time, which is sort of the the false idols sort of phenomenon. In every case we go through, whether it's bin Laden or Zarqawi, they're always doing things personally which undermine their own credibility. They're just as fallible as everybody else. You know, bin Laden's dying his hair, you know, Zarqawi's running around in track shoes. There's always like things that are there that never get pushed back in the source countries. Those stories never get heard. So it always sounds appealing until you get there and you realize, oh, this isn't, you know, what I thought it was going to be. That guy isn't so fantastic. We're not focusing on that at all. The West and the CT analysts that sort of follow it are all trying to figure out the world from social media because we can do it at our desk and we can get Chipotle burritos at lunch and that's great. But the truth is we're missing a whole layer right now of leaders that will lead the next generation of jihad. We're totally missing it. I don't know what they are either. But in Syria right now, there is some operational leaders, probably a dozen of them, that are going to be our next big problem. They're running the show there. And everybody tends to focus on, oh, there's a Zawahiri speech. Let's parse every single word that he says from, you know, wherever he's holed up at. You know, here's Adam Gadan. He looks a little thinner than last time. What does that mean? Who cares? Right now in Syria, there are tons of leaders at the, at the operational level that will be our next big strategic problem. And do we really have a handle on them? If you ask somebody now who are the top ten leaders in Al-Qaeda, I saw the most worthless CNN post on this last week. They literally go, top ten targets in CNN, and somebody Googled terrorist groups Al-Qaeda. And everyone that came up, they just put the leader down, all in a row, one, two, three, four, and they added a Siri, the bomb maker. Everybody likes that one, the bomb maker. Come on, the top ten can't possibly be just every group in order and we put their leader on a list. That's not what it is at all. There are guys, who had ever heard of this Ikrima guy in Barraway until Westgate Mall? Anybody tracking him? I wasn't tracking him. Yeah, this is happening all over right now, and most of the CT analysis is on the very superficial propaganda level. There are a whole bunch of operators. They're on social media too, but they're not sitting there going, Al-Qaeda's great, Al-Qaeda's great. They're going, hey... Wouldn't you like to come to Yemen? I know a guy, and they route him there. That's where we need to be focusing right now. That's the next layer. That, that's what we're going to be worrying about in the future. I, I haven't seen any analyst out there that are really working on it. I'm one of them. I'm not really working on it. Um, 
but it's something that needs to be done. Don't you, Clint, don't you think that's more of an Intel activity? It sounds really hard to do from open source. I do think it is, but I also think there's no one in the region doing good analysis, too, from the academic side. Academia and counterterrorism has really shifted rearward in a lot of ways. So, like, we did have a lot of people going to Iraq and sort of looking at AQI and ISIS and sort of diagnosing. There's tons of great work now that's out there on the Taliban, sort of looking at sub-leaders and what they're doing. You know, Vahid's done that kind of work. But I haven't seen much of that in the other theaters, which is interesting. You know, Shabab is a great example. There's all kinds of strange fractures that I haven't seen that sort of immersion in. The AQIM is a fantastic case study of like a lot of interesting sub-leaders, you know, about Mokhtar being one of them that we heard about for about 30 days or so in there, but that are pursuing their own sort of operational level stuff that are becoming strategic players. And I, I haven't seen that same sort of thrust, in my opinion. I do think it can be done there. I think there are regional experts, but they're not either not interested or not leveraged in the same way as we saw, like, during the CT boom years. Sir? Hi. I'm Gary Sargent, Asymmetric Technologies. Um, I have a sort of link with Lebanon. I spent a couple of years there. So my question is sort of a comment for you guys, if you could comment on sort of how Hezbollah, is, it help, is this going to help Nasrallah? in Lebanon is going to help his power base with the current fighting of the foreign fighters heading to um, from Hezbollah that are currently in Syria? I would think that this is still pretty much up in the air. It depends on how the war is going to go on. Uh, if Assad will continue to seem successful and Hezbollah will be able to pull back uh, and it will be able to uh, maybe in some way reduce the internal tension in Lebanon, the repercussions are not going to be so negative for Hezbollah. It seems that at this point uh, Hezbollah is definitely under pressure and the refugee camps uh, in the huge amount of refugees in Lebanon, uh, Sunni refugees, uh, is going to be a place where you will be able to recruit lots of people to act against Hezbollah. Uh, so I think that Hezbollah is in a tough position, but things are so fluid at, uh, at this point that the way that things are going now, maybe it's getting slightly better for uh, Nasala. Okay, last question from the audience. Hi, Paula Cook from the American Islamic Congress. Um, in my research of Syria, I don't really understand al-Nusra and um, Daesh or ISIS to be a coherent group across Syria even, that there are divisions within the organization, both of them, um, depending upon where you are in Syria. And uh, I think one of you, maybe Michael, noted in your opening remarks that a significant portion of the leadership of Daesh is foreign fighters. So I'm wondering, we're seeing already some of the different tactics that the organization is using inside Syria, and what do you think that might mean for the future of the organization with the leadership being foreign fighters and the larger fighting force not being that way? Do you think this is a point of weakness that we could see happen in the future? The organization might dissolve around that. Go ahead. So a few things. The longer the conflict goes on, the mo more coherent and cohesive the whole outcome will be for those groups. So this has endured, endured, endured for a long time. Um, that factionalization may be there, but within the groups, whether it's Nusra or ISIS or whatever group there, they're going to end up fighting now for many, many years, and so those that survive and are together are going to operate more fluidly, I think, in terms of the outcome. So that would be one thing. So the foreign fighters will get along better with the locals. That's how I see it. That's more of, you could kind of look back to the model of Afghanistan in the 80s and how groups sort of meshed up, you know, in Peshawar, uh, Taliban linkages and how it worked in with al-Qaeda linkages. Marriage, you know, finances, it all sort of weaves in the longer it goes on. So I think that is one of the things that, that will be key. The other one is then how they do the acceptance of local versus global objectives and how resistant the population is to that in the outcome of it. 
in Somalia, for example, they always kind of go, yeah, yeah, you know, global jihad, but then in the end everything comes down to a local battle, and that's where the sort of foreign fighter local conflict, you know, tends to come into play. I don't know how it will come out in Syria, you know, at this point. The infighting is hard for me to get my head around in, in both groups, but it's it's certainly there, as you say. And the there was one interesting report recently in the news just a couple of days ago about an emir in Damascus, a Nusra emir, um, giving an interview, a lengthy interview, in which he said um, that Nusra really has no stake in the final form of the Syrian state. They want to see Assad gone, but they're not going to press for an Islamic state. That certainly may be his point of view, but it is impossible to know if that represents the entire organization. I would suspect it doesn't. Um, one of the hallmarks of signing up for Al-Qaeda's agenda, one of the basic you know, things you have to sign up for is we would like an Islamic State, please. Um, but I think it's indicative of the kind of dynamic you're, you're talking about. And I think um, for all of the coherence that may come about over time, I think a lot more of the the differences between these regional commanders are going to come to the fore, of course, once Assad falls and the real fight for the form of the state begins. I read in a couple of places uh, that there are about a thousand groups, different battalions, and, and I assume that we can subsume many of them into certain organizations, but you're right, that points at the differences even within each organization. Uh, to a large extent, control over the funding of the resources can help in uh, bringing the number down and creating more unified, uh, more coherent organizations. And then you have the issue of who is doing better in a competitive environment. Uh, in some cases, you will see cooptation. In other cases, uh, you will see fighting. It can really go both ways. If you look at uh, Algeria, the JA disintegrated. It was decentralized. And as it was a decentralized organization and violence between the different elements uh, became so prominent, the whole opposition imploded. But then you have other places, if you look at uh, um, Al-Shabaab, where one faction managed to eliminate or force other groups to join Al-Shabaab because they lost that, that battle. So I think that either way, you're going to end up with more unified opposition. I think that there is a the ideological differences, but even if you just look at those groups that are uh, jihadi groups, they can agree at least on the fact that they want to bring Assad down. Some of the arguments that will come afterwards, they have enough time to, to deal with that. They can unite around certain set of uh, issues, and once you take the financial aspect that allows for such variety of groups to operate independently, then you will also narrow down the ideological differences. Well, thank you, Brock. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming out. Please uh, join me in thanking the panelists, thanking General Davis, Bob Fiedler, ROA, and the staff. Uh, I think we had a very informative uh, discussion today, and we are adjourned. Thank you. Thanks.